is Alia DeAngelis. Um, and what I'm presenting on is uh, servant leadership is dead. I know it's very provocative. Uh, when I found that out, I thought to myself, so now what do I have to learn? Um, but first I'm going to start with what I'm hoping for for you guys today. So today what I am not going to do is give a full exegesis of what the new leadership style is. That might be hours of conversation over coffee, tea, a Diet Coke, or something a little more potent. Um, but what I do want to leave you with, this is my only goal, is enough curiosity that you will investigate further how to lead a DevOps, possibly a DevOps sec, uh, with the potential, uh, a transformation, with the potential of, of that rest, getting rapid customer feedback and increased time to market and market disruption. And, and we all know, or we don't, massive recoveries of innovation time. So, uh, and, mark, and organizational transformation. So, a little bit about me. By and large, I am a corporate anthropologist. Some of my teammates will recognize this board since it is up and in current use. I'm also a coach and a scrum master and a program manager. Those are really just titles. At the end of the day, I stand in front of a team, people who, um, with good hearts, really just want to get something done, right? Or they're assigned to get something done. And it doesn't matter what you call me. That's how I show up. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it's good. So I'm also a heavy-duty sticky note user. For those, uh, there are lots of you who've been on my teams in this room. That should make you smile. I see a few in the audience. And um, don't have stock in 3M. And I'm a recovering command and control leader. Um, at the beginning of my career, which is about 18, 19 years ago, I started out in traditional project management. I'm super organized. I have a weird ability to sense and see patterns. Um, I'm not technical. I don't write code, but I can speak code super well. Um, and at the time, I really enjoyed that satisfaction of being in a group and pulling together. And I loved getting things done. Um, together, right? That's that anthropologist in me, like, look, it's a culture. We're in a little mini society for a hot minute. What I, what I didn't like was the requirement to do task and track, to put pressure on people, um, knowing that they were on a production issue or there was something else. So I got really good at being like, hey, I'll buy you muffins, or I'm so sorry. Like, I'm the best apologizer. I have so many ways to say, I'm so sorry, but... Um, super good at that. I didn't love it. I didn't love begging. I didn't love uh, death marches, right? All-nighters. Um, one time, for quite a while, there was a project I was on. Um, my three-year-old slept under my desk night after night. And one day he said, Mama, I, I want to know when I can sleep in my own bed. And that was a, an interesting moment for me because my team was on the pickup list at daycare and they would go and pick him up for me so he could sleep under my, under my desk. Um, and about that time, I got done with it. I was just really frustrated. I'm tired of hurting people. I'm tired of the whole fear-based thing. Um, it just didn't feel good to me. And so I took the LSAT and was applying at George Washington University Law School because I was finished. Uh, interesting, that was around 2006, and there was a transition in the market. This fancy thing called Agile sounded like a yoga word, didn't know what that was, and my boss at the time sent me off to get trained as a scrum master, and I was super stoked, and I went to California, and I was like, oh my gosh, you mean you don't guilt people, and you're not like throwing people under the bus, and you're not dealing with that, and they're like, no, it's magic, and I was like, I love this, and they're like, but you can't lead the same way, I'm like, what are you talking about, I don't, I don't get this. Like, you can't lead, lead the same way. It's a different leadership style. And I was like, well, well like, what, what is it? And they said, oh, it's servant leadership. Now, this is before Scrum had officially really adopted it. Now they have all kinds of outlines in the, the Scrum guide of what that means and doesn't mean. So this is way before. So I'm asking these people, um, and I can see the guy's face, so what is it? What is it? And he goes, well, you, just, you don't put pressure on the teams, and you don't task and track, and uh, they kind of... They have mastery, and I was like, over what? And they have autonomy, I'm like, well then how do they work together? And he's like, it's, it works, just trust me. And I'm like, 
that sounds like nobody's going to do anything. I, like, what do I do? And he was like, you're going you're gonna to hold a container. And, I, and then I felt like I was on retreat in the moment. So I totally drank that Kool-Aid and started to research servant leadership. At the time, not a lot out there, just not a lot. Then, because I am an overachiever, I decided, and I was interested, right? I was interested, what is this movement? I contacted the Greenleaf Ser uh, Center for Servant Leadership, which is in Indiana, and they're the founders of servant leadership, and I became a member, card-carrying, have almost all their books, and I traveled out to um, Indiana and did an intensive retreat with some of the people who know, some of their best people, and I, I sucked all that in, and I learned a lot, and I kind of got it, and then I began to practice and iterate on that for the last 10 years, and really um, have found myself in a different way as a human. I have certainly seen autonomy and mastery. I have witnessed greatness come out of teams when I have stepped back. Um, and I am glad to have stayed in technology and not gone to law school. I probably would have been more grouchy. So I really have embraced servant leadership. About two years ago, I was moved from software over to operations. I've been in operations. I've done UX, UI. I'm APIs, I'm kind of agnostic of where the location is of the technology. Could be the core, could be telephony, doesn't matter to me because I apply the same leadership principle, right? I don't have to know, you all know. It almost makes it better when I don't know, then I don't kibitz or anything. Um, so I moved over to operations and I began to see an interesting thing I hadn't seen before, which is this really big chasm that Scrum, I believe, so this is just my opinion, I believe Scrum and some of the agile, methodology, uh, agile methodologies created a chasm between multiple groups, right? As a Scrum master, um, you have to do certain things. You have to protect the team from other teams, right? From the enterprise. Someone's laughing, right? You do, that's what you do. You're like, protect the team. Don't talk to my team. Don't shoulder tap my team. What are you doing? So. We began to be very big protectors with regards to the software developers. And then I'm like, well, but I'm just gonna tell you DBAs, like your fancy BI server is not arriving anytime soon. How long have you known about it? Oh, six months. When do you need it? Well, we're, we need it in two days, we're gonna start testing. I don't know what to tell you. So I realized that because we had become so exclusive, right, to start getting engineering out the door, work hard, um, feature, 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 lots of pressure that we'd left out all the rest of our team. Then I thought, and then I started hearing uh, a lot of people complain, a lot of my sys admins, some of you are in here, and there is data out there, they were frustrated with leadership. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Somebody just nodded. I won't even look their way. They're like, I don't know, I don't even know what my scrum master does. So the scrum master's in the room. I just want you to know I love you. I totally get it. I'm not trying to be rude. But they complain, what does my scrum master do all day? They watch YouTube? Like they have meetings, they report out. And I'm like, I don't know. So I started observing, right, anthropologists, I started observing what are, what are scrum masters doing, right? Because I'm focused on this, uh, this facilitative behavior and realized that it had also kind of disempowered leadership. Uh, and it was frustrating people. So I would say to just, because I'm that kind of person, I would say to my friends, well, why don't we just go back to command and control? And they're like, no, we don't want that either. I'm like, well, then I don't know what to tell you because there's nothing out there. So as I looked around, this is what I realized uh, leadership had become. It's very hands off the wheel, right? They're a self-managing team. They are self-organizing. That's like self-organizing, like 1960s, give them a bud, tell them to figure themselves out. Like there's no leadership, right? I don't even know what you do. Does it work for you? You don't like that one? We'll give you some crack. I don't know. It's very interesting, though. So it's this thing like, hey, look, it's agile. It's magic. You don't even have to do anything. And I'm thinking, oh, snap, then I'm over, overachieving with my Post-it note meetings. Um, so then uh, along with all of that, right, operations realizing it wasn't really working out this you don't have the server that's, and configurations, oh, it broke, I don't know what to tell you, right? Like, if you didn't tell me what the configs were, I'm looking at Josh, where's Josh? Josh knows this. Um, I, I heard DevOps come, this word, DevOps. I was like, oh, I like that, it's like a marriage, marriage thing. People say, what is DevOps? I'm like, it's counseling. It's dev and ops therapy, and you've seen that in the tweets, most likely. And um, 
I convinced my boss, because I was interested enough at the time, he was a great guy, I said, hey, will you send me out to DUS, DevOps Enterprise Summit, right, 2015. And so he sent me out there, and I went, and I was listening, and I listened so much to HP and Target and Nordstrom's and Ticketmaster, right, big names, big names, enterprises, no excuses, right? If you have just an e-commerce website, it's so easy to say to somebody, oh, you can do DevOps because you don't got a mainframe. So these people were very, very transparent. They're like, we have mainframes with spaghetti code that looks like this, and we can do DevOps. So then I started to listen even more. And I'm taking notes. I was instructed to take notes. And here's what I heard, right? Alia, who thinks in patterns. I hear stuff. I love it. It sounds good. Makes total sense. But then I keep hearing, you can't lead the same way. Leadership is different. Uh, there's no way you can lead today. How, uh, how you're leading today will not work on a DevOps effort. I'm like, what? Maybe they're talking servant leadership. So I heard it enough time, times that I, I, about the first day, started going up to these people, stalking them, right? Because they're very highly available, generous people. And I said, what is it? You keep saying this, what is it? They're like, well, I'm like, is it servant leadership? They're like, nope, you can't use servant leadership anymore. I'm like, what? So this is kind of how I felt. I left does. I was like, any Bieber fans? Totally kidding you. My 14-year-old loves this slide. He thinks I'm a crackhead, because anyway, what do you mean? What do you mean? You can't use servant leadership. I don't get it. What do you mean? And they're like, well, I said, well, then what, what is it? I don't understand. And this is kind of what I heard, that fundamentally a DevOps leadership style is about facilitating collective and technical transformation. I'm like, oh, is it change management? They're like, no, mm -mm, that won't work. I'm like, well, what does work? And these are like CTOs, right? Articulate people handling lots of money. And I'm, I'm asking them, what, they, tell me what it is. Like, I'm humble. And they say, well, uh, so it's a different level of collaboration. You have to bridge dialogues. Um, it's not, I'm like, is it tooling? Because that's nice and safe, right? Like, oh, just give me a tool. We'll, I'll tell them to put that VM up, whatever. And they said, no, no, it's not that. So they're telling me these weird, you have to be very self-aware, and you have to be uh, emotionally intelligent. And I'm thinking to myself, this sounds like therapy. Uh, and I'm not sure about that, because I can't quite imagine doing that. So I'm saying, do you have a book? Do you have a video? Can someone tell me? And they're like, no, not really. Nordstrom's. Nordstrom's is known for doing DevOps the best right now. Um, and they're, the, they're known for being the best at dialing in the leadership. So I talked to Courtney Kessler, who is the VP there, and she said, when we get back, uh, I can't really describe this new leadership to you. And I said, OK. When I get back, I'll have my person contact you. She knows what it is, and uh, you can talk about it with her. I'm like, OK. So I did that. I also, went on the last day, bumped into someone named Eric Passmore. He's the CTO of MSN NBC. And there was this countenance about him He's kind of, he's not like a big guy or a flashy guy, but there was something very deep and resonant. And I could tell he understood deeply what this leadership was. Because at the end of the day, we're just trying to get things done, right? We don't want to work all night. We don't want uh, to be badgered. A lot of times we have to do mundane tasks and the repetitive tasks. And there's this possibility that if I lead right, this is what I'm thinking in my head, people can innovate and disrupt markets, and they can pull out of themselves what they can't today because there's a production issue, or there's a security issue, or the feedback loop was way too far down the line. And I wanted it so badly, so I said, I, I went outside, there was a big line, and I just waited and waited, and I said, eventually when it was my turn, I said, you get the leadership, it's a change, and he said, it is. I felt like I was talking to Yoda, because he was like so peaceful, and I said, uh, Direct me. Tell me. Uh, I, uh, no ego. And he said, I can't. It's, it's, you just have to know it. He said, but the book that has helped me the most, there's one book, it's not the end-all, be-all. It's called Adaptive Leadership. And it's not the military adaptive leadership, right? That's all over the internet where you behave one way in this situation, another way. It was something different. So me being me, I got the book. And then I have spent uh, the last number of months reaching out to my network. I did speak to the woman at Nordstrom's, and what she said to me was, um, yeah, it's a little bit like lean leadership. I'm like, what do you teach people? She goes, well, I have them come in, and we talk about how they are as leaders, and we make an A3, and they carry it around, and they're going to improve. I'm like, but 
but what do you do? Like, what is it? She goes, well, they reflect. And then we reflect every week. And again, I'm thinking, okay, this sounds like therapy. Like, do you do that at work? Are you allowed? And she, then she told me these incredible results and what these new leaders were able to bring out of the employees and of themselves. So I, I really came to ground that apparently it works, but again, she was not able. I said, is there a book? She said, well, no, not really. No, you just kind of have to know it. So I stepped back, and I went back to my childhood for examples. Who have I known that might be like this? And this is where it landed. What dawned on me is that we're all going the same direction for a lot of years, right? Because uh, scrum masters were protecting the team. It's like you're protecting engineering. So this is how the thought process went in my head. Well, so Scotty in engineering, this is the original series, so I'm sorry to those who don't know this, but Scotty in engineering, right? So the scrum master's like, don't come in the doors. We're not gonna give you power for life support. Um, we can't do that. We gotta finish our, we gotta keep the core healthy. We don't care if you're all gonna die. So that's kind of maybe a little hyperbole, but that's almost where it's landed. And I thought, we kind of forgot we're all delivering together. The whole marketing, billing, like if your billing's not in place and you go to market and then you can't bill, that's a problem, right? What if you can't train? What if you have contracts and you didn't give them the 90-day the notice, right? Um, and we lost sight of that. We lost sight that we need everyone on the ship because um, we're going to go through an asteroid belt. We're going to do something crazy. We're not going to take the long way. We're going to go the short way. There's going to be danger, so I need everybody on it. And then I thought, well, what about those leaders? So there's, there's Captain Kirk, right? Um, and Captain Kirk, he was a risk taker. He, there was never a no, right? Never, ever a no. It was always, we can do this. Figure it out. Um, I know we can. And there was never a can't be done. And he would boldly go. He would so boldly go. Uh, but he would also sacrifice people to get the job done. Uh, he was a bit of an egomaniac, and he, oh, right, you know that, William Shatner, but he would leave from the front and didn't always listen uh, to what was happening from behind, and he just assumed people would follow him, right? This kind of wasn't an option. So I thought, well, I like the good things about, uh, about James T., and then Picard, who doesn't love Picard? Picard was like listening. He could speak to people who were well below his rank, and he was very inclusive. He would consult. Um, other things he would, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. He was an excellent co communicator, a lifelong learner who doesn't want a boss that is a lifelong learner. Um, he knows everybody's strengths and weaknesses, and he would play to those. He wasn't critical, right? He was like, yeah, this is where you're good. We should backfill with war. Um, very cooperation oriented and preventative and strategic. He also had a very diverse ship, right? Really welcomed diversity. Um, but on the other hand, he was kind of a safe guy, right? Not a big risk taker, so to speak. He kind of went by the book, not necessarily disruptive. So given that these are the main leaders of my childhood, um, I went to the Avengers too and I thought, well, I really like Iron Man, but Iron Man in Age of Ultron went off the radar, he did skunk works, and it screwed everything up, so you probably don't want to be Iron Man either. And then his team called him out, those of you who haven't seen it, compelling film. Um, but he, he got called out by his team for skunk works. I'm sure none of you have ha ever had skunk works happen in your groups. Um, so that way you can't, you can't be Iron Man even if he's super cool. So we're going to go back to Kirk and Picard. And I thought, well, I really just want the best. Maybe DevOps leadership is someone who knows when to step forward and when to pull back, when to pull the best out of you and backfill when you're not able to be there because that's just not your thing. Like, what is that? And uh, I thought we could do a combo. So maybe it's a combo of Picard and Kirk, a little unicorn. And then I was like... That's the person that I would want to be. Um, maybe fewer disasters. I do like Tribbles. I thought that was cool. Um, and I thought, well, well, if that's really what it is, I started writing down these descriptors. And then I started calling friends, friends at Disney who are doing a DevOps transformation. 
at Avalanche, at other places who, around the nation, and I, I said, so is this, is, is this the list? And I would send them videos and say, watch this, is this the sense you're getting of what the leadership is? Because they call, right? Because we're all stressed out. I don't even know how to lead this. You know, we're, we're all universal translators, right? We're all, we are all ahuras, you're like, oh, speak, speak ops to me? This is what it means, Dev, it's no big deal. They weren't being rude, they were just saying, oh snap, we can't get the server, or oh snap, we need your configs. Um, and I began to suss it out. So today, in a, in a couple minutes, I'll share with you just a list of things I've sent out to colleagues nationwide to say, is this what it, it takes? Is it this kind of person? Is it this kind of um, behaviors and tactics that you use? To, to be this, com uh, this combination. And what they said was yes, and when we all talked about it, right, because it's a little overwhelming to have a leadership style change, um, this is kind of how they felt. A little bit like a rainbow, kitty, unicorn, butterfly, everything magical all in one place. And then I thought, well, can you do it? You know, servant leadership, I went back to that place and thought, when I went from command and control to servant leadership, uh, there was a moment when the anthropologist in me came, came out and went, this changes how we work. This changes how we regard one another. And I knew that it was a cultural movement. It wasn't just a new process. This was one of those moments where I went, what if, you know, what if we didn't have to do what the robots could do, so to speak, robots are good, um, but what if we could do that? What if we could break all the rules now because we had the time? Um, and again, I began to, to have a list of things that were qualities. So the qualities, uh, first and foremost, is emotionally intelligent. Because you're asking all these groups, the whole ship has got to get through the asteroid belt. Every single person's gonna feel a different, different, uh, a different way. They're gonna feel a different pressure. Um, so I need to be emotionally intelligent. I don't just need to be emotionally intelligent, I need to be self-aware. I think those are interesting things to separate. Self-aware and um, emotionally intelligent. Because you could be emotionally intelligent and not aware of what you're bringing to the picture. Someone on my team that I currently have, he scrum mastered for me um, recently when I was out of town, and I came back early and he popped his head up and he's like, I'm so glad you're back. And I said, why? He said, because what you do is hard. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you just have to be patient, you have to be calm. Like, what do you do when you're getting upset? And I said, well, what you do is I know now, after 10 years, in my body, what emotion starts where. And I can feel it. And I have a handful of things in place to arrest that feeling from getting in the way. It doesn't mean I shut myself down. It means I know. So I, I have that self-awareness. When you're trying to disrupt, you're trying to get people to innovate, they're going to take risks, and it's going to be scary, and it's new tooling. We have to show up as leaders, emotionally intelligent and aware. Um, egalitarian, such a big word. It's a favorite uh, anthropology word. It means equal. Flatten the hierarchy. I don't actually care how experienced you are. Let's work together. It doesn't matter to me. See, we're, all, we're getting the, the ship through the asteroid belt, so I don't care if you're the grand poobah of food. We're just not doing that. We're all equal. And that's a game changer, right? Everybody has a voice. You can change things when you can hear everybody's voice. It doesn't mean it goes on ad nauseum. There is diverging and converging. That's a whole other conversation. Um, engaged. Get your hands back on the wheel, right? We've taken, leadership has taken their hands off the, the wheel, and they, we need to get back on the wheel. It doesn't mean we're command and control, but get engaged. Show up, talk with me, be with me, understand, get the best out of me because I'll give you the best if you can get the best. Make that space for me. Um, experimental, let's experiment. And that implies blameless. I am not going to experiment if it's not blameless because I'm not gonna to take that risk. How many kids, you don't have to raise your hand. You know when you're in grade school and the teacher asks a question, you're like, I got this and you answer, and the teacher's like, I, no. And it was something that might have been right, but it wasn't to the test, or it wasn't to the curriculum. I had a teacher call me and say, my son was too creative 
because they were talking about clouds and she was teaching the different clouds and he had a whole story about the clouds and it wasn't appropriate for the classroom. And I was like, it was pre-K by the way, and I was like, what? She was, we, we really have to get through the curriculum. And so, so much of the time we've learned to keep our mouths shut, even if we know the answer, it's just not worth it, right? Like I'm not gonna talk, you're not gonna listen anyway. So we need to be experimental, let people talk, empathetic. Um, even if you don't care, about somebody else's stuff. We need to, to find why it's important and then bridge it. Being able to bridge the different uh, disciplines, super important. Um, inclusive, we've gotten so exclusive in Scrum and in other agile methodologies, so exclusive. Let's start to include, do it at the right times so that it doesn't mess your whole sprint up or your release. Um, inquisitive, sometimes we think we have to know everything or sometimes we do know everything, but we forget to engage ourselves in curiosity. And when we engage in curiosity and play, we begin to encourage experimentation and innovation uh, in all of our uh, coworkers and constituents. And then what ends up happening is the transformation. It's not, it's not a change. I love Ralph Laura of HP said at Does, and I, I loved, it was a, a really important quote to me. He said, you cannot make a faster caterpillar you have to transform. You have to become a butterfly. And then he chased that with, and that is, that is why you lead differently. Um, some of the references. Star Trek. You can go watch Original Next Generation. I kind of put that up there to be funny, but you guys aren't laughing a lot today. Um, oh, in your head. I, thank you. Uh, Simon Sinek. I mean, that's a given, right? That's a good one on YouTube. Deborah Gordon, I'm positive you haven't heard of her. She has studied ants. Just by raise of hands, have, has anybody heard of Deborah Gordon? Okay, a few of you, right? Ants, ants and data points and how they organize. There is a fallacy, there is no queen. She doesn't tell them what to do. It is all based on data points and a tipping point of just enough that the, the ant then changes its behavior. Super cool. Um, I feel like DevOps collaboration is a lot like ants. My friend from Disney actually called me, she said, I use that just the other day, oh, I use that all the time now in my meetings when I'm describing what we're doing and I make everybody watch the ants video, I'm like, fabulous. The practice of adaptive leadership, tools, tactics, and changing your organization in the world, that's the one that Eric Passmore gave me. But that's a lot about getting you in the right place and knowing what you're asking people to do, right? Uh, Toyota Kata. Managing people for improvement, adaptiveness, and superior results. So that one I kind of took away from the Nordstrom's people. Uh, that it's a lot about that coaching kata, and again, bringing uh, the best out in people. Group genius, the creative power of collaboration. Um, there is so much data in this book about there is no lone genius. And I am 100% positive that most of you work with somebody who thinks they're the lone genius. Very powerful. Uh, primal leadership, that's all about knowing that when you show up as a leader, how you show up mentally affects everybody because we, we're so nonverbal. So if I show up disengaged or frustrated or angry, uh, it's different. You will, you will impact the people you're working with. So as we move into a new discipline, a culture movement of DevOps with the CD pipeline, knowing people's jobs will not be the same. Some of them will go away and they will be retooled. That is scary. There's a lot of loss. You as the leader showing up in a calm, confident place uh, isn't just servant leadership. It's a leadership of being, right? When it, when it comes down to it, that's where it ends for me is uh, I, think, I think DevOps leadership asks us to be in a different way, to be more being, more human, and we're allowing other people to do that at work as well. So things to reflect on. What am I asking you to do? I don't know if that is, can you read that? No. Okay, I can barely read it and it's on my own screen. So I'll read it to you. Uh, I want you to reflect on your leadership style. You don't have to be in management. I know a number of you in this room and you are silent leaders and people follow you. Um, so ask yourself, how self-aware am I? How emotionally in control am I? Can I speak dev and ops? How about security? Could I translate? Translating is 
Um, from some of my friends out on the coast, they've all said, you are a big translator when you get into this mess because you've got to help people de-escalate those fighting words. You've got to know how to do that. How comfortable am I not being the one who knows? Right, that lone genius behavior. Being clueless, managing ambiguity, letting things be ambiguous. Right, that's all towards being comfortable with experimentation. How would I feel if there was no hierarchy? Right? Certainly there was a time early in my career where I relied upon my hierarchy to get things done. I'll just be very transparent. Now I look for influence and again, bringing the best out in them. Uh, what about no political power? What if you got a whole lot of nothing? How is that for you? How can I hold space in the tension of transformation? It gets tense. It gets tense. It gets hard. People, you're taking things away from them. We're humans and we are fragile. I have learned that recently. Um, and I gotta be there. I gotta be in that space. So how do I take care of me? Can I hold that space? Can I move through not caring about someone's issue to understanding and bringing it uh, and bridging it with other disciplines? Again, that, I keep coming back to that because that is one I hear that people are struggling with, struggling with the most, is timing, pressures, all of that between these groups. And uh, kind of lastly, am I up for the journey? You know, it isn't change, it's a transformation. You're not going to be different, your organization will not be different. My hope would be that your product is not different that you can disrupt, that you can have fun, right? that you stop having to just do production issues and mundane things or spaghetti code, almost dead, monolith, you know, mainframe, falling apart stuff. That is my hope. So with that, this is what I have gathered over the last 10 months. There is no name. I assume that in the next few years, as more books come out, you know there are very few books about DevOps. As more books come out, someone smarter than me may possibly write a book about how it is, and they'll start some trainings. I hope to see you there. That is all I have. Thank you.